Welcome. Uh, so, uh, my name is Devesh Kapoor. I'm the director of CASI. And I'd like to welcome you all to CASI's annual lecture. <coughs> it's a great uh, pleasure like, for me to introduce P -P Professor Raghuram Rutajan. Uh, he is the uh, Eric uh, Gleacher Distinguished Service P Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago. And he's, he's uh, a product of IIT Delhi. I'm Ahmedabad and MIT. Uh, he spent a few years as the chief economist uh, at the IMF. And currently, he's also been uh, sort of heading a, 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 a commission appointed by the government of India on financial sector reforms. Uh, uh, he has. Actually, he was the recipient of the first <coughs> uh, Fisher Black Prize 
which is given to uh, a person under the age of 40 who's made the most uh, significant contributions to the theory and practice of finance. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to, to welcome to Professor Garza. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for having me here uh, at uh, this fine center and uh, giving me the opportunity to meet uh, some old friends. I um, want to talk about mm -hmm. the political economy of banking sector reforms, but I want to use this not so much uh, to talk about the details of, of banking sector reforms. We can go into that a little later. But I want to talk about two or three forces which I think are going on, three or two or three clashes that are going on in India. And I want to use the banking sector as an example of, of this kind of clash. And to my mind, uh, over time, the way these are decided will determine the direction of, of the Indian economy uh, going forward. And I don't think too many people are thinking about that right now. There's a, a discussion some of us were having uh, during the reception. Um, one of the clashes I'm going to talk about uh, uh, in passing or directly, one is the tension between the haves and the have-nots. And this demonstrates itself in, in many ways. Uh, it used to be urban-rural, but in the banking sector, it's not so much urban-rural. It is certainly rich poor, the high income versus low income. It's the uh, well-managed states versus the poorly managed states, um, the states with good institutions, the states with bad institutions, the upper caste versus lower caste. Lots of cleavages uh, which reflect this, but fundamentally it's, it's, a, it's an economic divide which, which can also be uh, uh, translated into other divides. It's rich versus poor. The second big confrontation is going to be between the private sector and the public sector, or call it uh, between markets and the state. This is something that's going on also in India at the same time. And there is sometimes a view that these two clashes go along traditional sort of uh, 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 directions. That is, it's the markets and the rich versus the state and the poor. The state is fighting on behalf of the poor, and markets fighting on behalf of the rich. My sense is this is where I think really uh, the wires get crossed in India. It's not necessarily true that currently or going forward, uh, the state is doing the right thing by the poor. In fact, I think what is happening is the state is failing the poor miserably. But I think going forward, if uh, uh, we don't, uh, we don't uh, do the right things, it is quite possible that the state be hijacked by the rich, by the oligarchy, so to speak, and India become a very different country from the kind uh, that we, we know now. And this is a danger. I'm not saying it's, 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 uh, it's about to happen or uh, it's on the cards, but it is a possibility that one has to uh, keep track of. And this is why I think just succumbing to the stereotype and saying the state works for the poor and we should encourage more of the state is not particularly a good idea in, in India uh, today. Uh, we need to demolish these stereotypes because they don't serve us well. The third uh, uh, kind of, of clash which will come uh, is between uh, the foreign and the domestic sectors. Uh, and I think these will get confounded with the first two. And I'll, I'll use the banking sector to make these, the examples clearer because I think these three kinds of tensions between the rich and the poor, between the state and, uh, and the market, and between the foreign and domestic sector are all intertwined in the example of the banking sector. So that's, that's where I'm going to go. That's, that's, uh, I'm going to use this as an example of the challenges. And later, when, when, when uh, uh, we have a discussion, please uh, uh, try and push me on that. Um, it is something that I, I, I do want to talk about. So um, in terms of the specifics of the banking sector itself, everything starts in the banking sector with bank nationalization. Uh, started in 69, there was a fresh wave of nationalization in 79. 
Uh, I want to talk about why the rationale that was given uh, and in fact did it work? Did the nationalization of the banking sector work and, and meet uh, at least the criteria that were laid out for nationalization? I want to then talk about uh, uh, the famous uh, reform phase in the early 90s following crisis and I think that's also uh, sort of uh, um, consistent with the fact that there was a developing crisis in the banking system and there were reforms proposed in the banking system and it led generally to competition and to the rise of markets and, and greater openness in the Indian financial sector. Now where I think we are is in a phase where we are protecting the public sector and that is impeding reforms and I'll talk about, uh, about that in, in, in just a bit and then talk about the future, what I think might happen, the way this might get resolved, and how India might progress on the, on the financial sector after this. So start first with nationalization. Now, uh, in 1969, the biggest, 14 biggest Indian banks were nationalized. Uh, and uh, the rationale then uh, was that uh, India was a planned economy. Because it was a planned economy, the government wanted to direct credit. And uh, it felt that the banks were dominated by the private houses, which were lending to the private sector and not to, uh, according to the planning needs of the government. Furthermore, there was small industry. There were farmers uh, who required finance. And this all added up to social control and nationalization. That was the idea behind nationalization. Essentially, uh, too much of a private interest dominated industry, we need to make it much more open to the people, and that's, that's, that's why we have to do it. Now, that was the, the stated rationale. The other rationales, of course, in the background was, were that Indira Gandhi, uh, at this time, was, was fighting the old guard in the, in the Congress, trying to establish her own unique brand. Uh, and uh, this was her populist phase, or at least the beginning of the populist phase. Remember, the 71 election was fought on Garibi Hatao, uh, uh, the, the old guard in the Congress uh, had the slogan, let's get rid of Indira Gandhi, which was Indira Hatao. And uh, uh, instead, she in a master stroke converted that to they say Indira Hatao, I say Garibi Hatao. Garibi means poverty. Uh, and so instead of uh, getting rid of me, let's get rid of poverty. That was her slogan. And she won the 71 election uh, uh, in a landslide. This was also the time when she expropriated the the, the former Maharajas who had been promised a privy purse by the government and essentially the government reneged. Uh, but this was essentially her socialist phase. And so there could have been a genuine desire uh, at this time to essentially try and reach out to rural India, to reach out to the very poor. And uh, there was a feeling that the only way this could, ha could be done was through a nationalized banking sector and therefore uh, you had large-scale nationalization. Now, did it work? And the question is, what do we really mean when we say work? Well, first, of course, uh, it worked in the sense that the banking system became completely public sector dominated because you had just taken over the largest banks. But there were also, uh, I think, uh, strong incentives given for the banking system to expand in rural areas. Uh, for example, if you wanted to open a branch uh, in an uh, urban area, you could open it, but only on condition that you open four more in rural areas. So this obviously led to a tremendous expansion in rural branches. And once you had rural branches, you also had a lot of rural credit. And that's what you see in this graph. Uh, you see that post-nationalization, remember 69 was the first wave of nationalization, 79 was the second wave. Uh, you see an immense increase in rural branches. Now, some of this would have happened even if you didn't nationalize because you forced it on, on banks by saying you get more branches only if you open in rural areas. Uh, but this took place in a very, very big wave until uh, in uh, 1990, post-reforms, uh, the act was repealed, after which you can see the number of rural branches that are being opened essentially falls to zero. The charitable view of that was there were enough rural branches, there was no need for more rural branches. The uncharitable view is, look, 
uh, uh, they basically, once they weren't forced by the government, stopped opening anymore. And we'll talk a little more about that. Um, so uh, the, uh, the first was that there was this rural bias. And you know every politician will say 70% of India, 60% of India, whatever the number is at that time, lives in the villages. Therefore, we need more rural credit. Uh, but what, did, what effect did rural credit have? And there is some evidence of poverty alleviation. Uh, uh, a study by Burgess and Pandey suggests that it did seem to have some correlation with poverty alleviation. But you know, pouring money into anything is, even if I do fiscal transfers, I'm going to alleviate poverty a little bit. The question is, did it also affect growth rates? And there you see very little evidence. You see very little evidence that all this rural credit that went in uh, affected agricultural investment or affected agricultural growth. And so the question is, why didn't the banking sector pouring all this money into rural areas have any effect? And part of the answer has to be that a lot of this was misallocated. That it didn't go to the right people, didn't go to the right places, and uh, perhaps was not accompanied by enough public investment as a result, there was wastage in the process. Uh, some examples of these are the political uh, uh, influence over lending, which have, has been documented, uh, for example, by Sean Cole, uh, shows that there's a significant expansion in loans by public sector banks around the timing of elections, and especially in marginal constituencies where the government has some chance of, of, of losing the election. So uh, this is something that is documented. But what is also well known is there were uh, things like the loan mailers. Loan mailer was a uniquely Indian invention, which was a fair, where uh, mailer is, uh, is sort of uh, loosely translated as fair. And in the loan mailer, the politician came. The public sector banks were, were summoned to that, that mailer. And they were told who to lend to. And uh, you know, this is without any credit uh, evaluation, et cetera. Uh, purely on the word of the politician that this is a sound credit. So obviously his friends and relatives got credit, uh, and equally obviously they didn't bother to repay it. Uh, there were uh, significant losses made in this kind of activity. A second uh, function of these, uh, of these banks was to participate in many of the programs the government set up, uh, which uh, 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 forced banks to give uh, very highly subsidized loans uh, into the uh, 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 in uh, two particular uh, segments, and the problem is rural India needs credit. It is starved of credit. There are lots of people who want money, so they are actually willing to pay a fair amount to get that money. Now, when you say you're going to give a fraction of the money they need at a highly subsidized rate, what do you think happens? Supposing there's a highly subsidized loan available, and there are 300 people who want it. People with the best credit get the loan? The guy who bribes the most gets the loan, right? And he's not necessarily the best credit. In fact, he's the guy who has no intention of repaying, because that's the only way he's going to justify the bribe. So what you see is that uh, uh, loans uh, directed through a mix of uh, political influence and bribes, rural credit gets a bad name. It doesn't get repaid because what you're doing is you're not charging a market price. You're allowing the loan to be given by the loan officer who can easily pocket the difference. And there's tremendous demand for it. It's not properly directed. Uh, and also, you know, once you've made this bad loan as a loan officer, you and the guy receiving it both have an incentive to have a loan waiver, right? If the politician comes around and says, I waive all the loans, it's great, because nobody's going to follow up and find out who gave this loan and why did it turn bad. And uh, so you had repeated loan waivers in which everybody participated, uh, the politician, the banker, and the recipient, because it was a, in everybody's interest. So just to show you some of these things, this is a World Bank study uh, on the cost of borrowing in rural India. And this is actually a shocking study when you look at the numbers. Uh, here is the interest rate that is charged by any of these uh, different uh, entities. This is the bank, typically a state-owned uh, state bank. This is a regional rural bank. This is the cooperative. These are schemes uh, by the government of India. 
these interest rates are extremely low, right? Because the cost of accessing these people and giving a loan in the kinds of amounts that they want can be very high. The typical uh, um, uh, um, microfinance institution says that to break even, it needs a, a rate of about 24%. So in other words, this is a very highly subsidized rate. Well, what happens? Uh, um, typically, what happens is that a lot of households report bribes in order to get the loan, right? And what is a bribe as a percentage of the amount approved? Uh, on average, about 10% for a bank, 42% for these schemes. If you're paying 42% of the loan as a bribe, I mean, what chance is, it, is there that the loan will ever be repaid, right? Uh, you own the loan. I got it. I paid for it. Why should I pay anything back? So uh, this is the other thing I want to point to is look at the time it takes, right? State banks are good because the bribe is relatively low. But look at the time that they take to give a loan, 33 weeks, OK? Now, I want you to keep that in mind because I want you to look at the next uh, chart, which says, what do people in rural India want loans for? This is from a survey done by IIEF. Uh, it's an institute which has done some very good work in, uh, in Delhi. And what it says is financial emergencies, and this next one is medical emergencies, are the things that most concern the poor households. Now, if I have to wait, wait 33 weeks to get the money when I have a financial emergency, am I going to go and borrow from the bank? No. I'm going to go to my local money lender who gives me money on tap. He obviously charges a very high rate of interest, but he's the guy I'm going to go to, right? So the point here is that for the kinds of activities that people need the most money for, the state-owned banks are simply not there. And uh, so uh, part of what's going on is these loans aren't particularly timely. They aren't well directed. And as a result, all this rural credit is not doing much either for welfare or for growth. OK? Um, the, the, the other thing I want to point to is insurance, right? So one possibility is, look, these guys aren't in the growth business. The public sector banks in rural areas aren't about growth. They're about helping the average person. And so what they do is they have a public sector view of things. If there's a really severe problem, they're going to come in and help these guys, right? When are the problems most severe in rural areas? When there's a drought, when rainfall is well below normal rainfalls, right? So uh, it is clear that the public sector is going to lend more uh, to rural areas because they have more branches in there. But let's take an area where you have a public sector bank and a private sector bank, and let's try and see how their behavior differs depending on the amount of rainfall that particular area receives, right? Do they behave differently in terms of the amount of credit they give? And, and I want to uh, show you this, uh, this chart and walk you through this. Essentially, what we're looking at here is uh, doing econometric corrections, which you don't need to worry about. And this is uh, done by a guy at Harvard Business School who's done a lot of good work on banking in India for Sean Cole. Um, here is the amount of rainfall. This is drought. This is a lot of rainfall, which can be good for, for agriculture uh, so long as you don't flood the area. So what this is saying is the difference uh, on the y-axis, we have the difference between the loans made by the public sector and the loans made by the private sector. And so what you see first is in terms of total credit growth, you see absolutely no difference between a private sector bank and a public sector bank in a rural area in times of drought. That's why that number is close to zero. Okay? And as you get into uh, better, uh, better times, times when there's plenty of rainfall, you see that the difference turns significantly negative. That is, the private sector banks are making far more loans in the rural areas than the public sector banks. In other words, the private sector banks in bad times are no, no different, but in good times they make far more in terms of loans, which is what you want. They're directing credit the right way at the right times, right? That's one. But I want you to take a look at something else, which is when you look at agricultural credit, 
This is the thing that politicians keep jumping up and down about. That is, agricultural credit is the soul of the nation. We need more agricultural credit. Look in times of drought. In times of drought, the private sector banks actually give more agricultural credit than the public sector banks, correcting for everything else. Right? And again, the line uh, uh, tends to meander near zero. So in bad times, they're better. In good times, as far as agricultural credit goes, they're no different. Okay? Uh, where the public sector compensates is in consumption credit. They tend to be better on consumption credit in bad times, right? but much worse in good times. Bottom line, what do you want to take away from this, is that it's not as if the public sector is dying to help out the agriculturalist in bad times. In fact, by some measures, the private sector is better at it, uh, at helping out the agriculturist. Okay? So it's not that they're providing tremendous amounts of insurance. And in terms of directing the loans towards profitable opportunities, it turns out that probably the private sector is a little better. There was a question here. Yeah. Possibly, but uh, on consumption, the public sector banks are a little better. On production, the private sector banks are better. So on average, they, they're no different. That's what you saw in total credit growth. They're no different because they balance each other out. Now, the theory of nationalization would have it that the public sector should be far more willing to help in bad times. It's acting as social insurance. And that's not happening. Okay, it's not acting as social insurance. Right? And in terms of enabling better livelihoods for these people, the private sector is probably doing a little better. Now, uh, there is a problem with the private sector, which I'll come to in just a second, which is they simply are not there in the rural areas, at least in the quantities that you would want them to be. Uh, going along this track of did nationalization work, uh, well, uh, on, in the urban areas, uh, clearly lending to corporations was important. And given that l the license Raj was flourishing at that time, Anybody who got a license also effectively got credit at that point because the government directed the credit towards the people who got licenses. Uh, the culture of repayment on the corporate side was equally bad. That is, uh, people keep talking about agricultural credit being bad, but corporations also essentially had very little incentive to repay, and uh, uh, a lot of bank debt was essentially treated as a subordinate equity stake. What do I mean by subordinate equity stake? It means that if you're real, doing really, really well, you think about paying your bank debt. But otherwise, you know, let them bear some of the losses. And that was the view, uh, uh, certainly in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, the government also uh, uh, took a lot away from the banking sector, preempting uh, uh, financing itself through uh, these various requirements, the CRR and SLR requirements, statutory liquidity uh, uh, ratio, for example, where you had to hold some bonds of the government, uh, and also uh, force the banks to lend to uh, particular industries that it thought was important. Uh, the agricultural sector was a big part of the priority sector. So essentially, you had a lot of directed lending with the consequences that favored industries uh, got financing. Uh, and uh, innovative industries obviously were left out of the loop because they weren't part of any uh, directed credit program. Uh, moreover, these banks, for anybody who had been to a public sector bank in the 70s and the 80s, uh, would have known there was, uh, uh, it wasn't customer friendly, it wasn't technology friendly, uh, there was extreme degrees of risk aversion, it was a bureaucracy in those banks uh, in terms of loans, uh, there's an extreme unwillingness to uh, develop new methods of working with customers. The unions were very strong and very powerful. Computerization was re resisted. Uh, and if you were a loan officer and you stretched your neck out a little bit, right, uh, and you were, you know, somebody defaulted on you, uh, it wasn't thought of as a business decision. Uh, the Central Vigilance Commission came after you and asked why, in fact, the loan had gone bad, right? So only government-sanctioned loans 
you could be safe on because you could point to somebody else and say, they told me to give the loan. But if you made the loan of your own accord and it went bad, uh, you had the Vigilance Commission after you. And that's still the case, and I'll talk about the problems that, that there might be. Very little focus on retail credit. Retail credit was not a big deal at all uh, because, of course, India was on this, uh, uh, this uh, investment-led growth uh, phase, and consumption was not thought as, uh, of as very important. So this was the state of the banking sector post-nationalization. Many of the stated aims were, in a sense, fulfilled uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, bureaucratic fulfillment, but in actual practice, uh, the poor did not get financing, uh, it didn't provide adequate insurance, and innovation, new technologies, all that were left out. Growth was, in fact, not being financed. It was, it was very directed credit. And uh, the health of the banks uh, grew from bad to worse as a result of the bad agricultural loans that were made, the loan waivers that were made, and the bad uh, credit to the industrial sector. The poor health of the banks, their low profitability and the high non-performing assets led to two extremely far-sighted reports. And this was during the reform phase. Uh, the two reports was Narsimum uh, 1 and Narsimum 2. Extremely interesting reports, and I'd advise you, any of you who have an interest in the banking sector to read those. Uh, essentially, it laid out a set of steps the government should take. Okay? And first, get rid of in interest rate uh, controls, liberalize the interest rates, reduce the amount that the government absorbs from the banking sector. Don't take away 50% of their funds and leave them with 50% to, to dispose of how they want. Uh, instead, reduce how much you're going to take away of their funds. Don't tell them who to lend to. So depoliticization of lending was one of the steps mooted by Narsimum. And there was an attempt to professionalize bank management and to get these banks to be run as, as, uh, as normal corporate entities. Uh, branching, uh, it said, you know, don't force them to branch where they don't want to go to. Allow private banks to enter. Remember, because you nationalized the largest banks, there were only a few small old private banks left. And so Narasimham said, get new private banks, allow them to enter. Their competition will change the landscape in the Indian banking system. Allow foreign banks to come in and expand. So it wanted foreign banks to come in and expand. It said, do away with any restrictions on branches. Allow people to go where they want. Let them open branches wherever they want. That's going to lead to competition. Competition is going to, going to be healthy for the, for the banking system. Of course, that, that particular recommendation was ignored by the RBI, which is the Reserve Bank of India. Um, also, because so many people basically thought of as debt as an option, uh, where you repaid if you were doing really well. If you weren't doing particularly well, you stopped paying and just you know, uh, made, made the debt holders tag along. Uh, this, these committees recommended giving debt holders stronger teeth and an ability to recover, at least for the banks. And that has led to debt recovery tribunals and what is called the Sarfesi Act, which allows uh, banks to recover their debt by threatening to seize the company, seize its assets, and so on. So this has been a good thing in letting banks actually get their money back. One of the most important recommendations it offered was stop holding on to the banks. As the government let go, reduce your stake in the banks from over 50%, bring it down to 33%, uh, you know, get rid of the government holding these banks. This was, of course, not acted upon and I think it has consequences which are with us uh, today. Now, I just want to uh, uh, sort of contrast this with what happened in the markets. So the banking sector reforms, uh, the bunch of detailed reforms which were proposed, the most important reform, which was get the government out of the business, allow these banks to become uh, you know, government-linked banks, but not directly owned by the government, that was not acted upon. On the other hand, in the markets, what happened was there was this incumbent exchange, the Bombay Stock Exchange, right? The Bombay Stock Exchange had really archaic practices. Um, you know, when a trade was done, uh, the time when the trade was done was not noted. If you told your broker, go sell these shares for me, three days later, he'd come back and say, I sold it. And invariably, you'd get the lowest price in those three days, right? Because there's no 
notation of when he actually sold it for you. And if you bought shares, of course, you bought it at the highest price over the last three days. Uh, settlement was over long periods of time. There was uh, rampant problems in settlement. Every so often, there was fraud. Uh, this, was, this was really archaic. National Stock Exchange was set up as a really transparent electronic uh, exchange. Uh, it, you know, the times uh, uh, were, were recorded. Settlement periods were reduced from five days, 10 days, down to world best practi practices, uh, T plus one. And because all this happened, because it focused on giving the customer a good experience, liquidity shifted from the, the Bombay Stock Exchange to the National Stock Exchange. Uh, from being the monopoly venue in some sense of all the trades, the Bombay Stock Exchange nowadays accounts uh, for most stock for less than 10% of total trades, with 90% being on the National Stock Exchange. Um, the kinds of institutions that are available on the National Stock Exchange, stocks are dematerialized. Uh, there are uh, pretty rock solid depositories. Settlement, as I said, takes place in, in, uh, in uh, world standard time. Why did this happen? While the banking sector reforms were halting and went a little way, they did not go anywhere near what the two Narsimham Committee reports had proposed, the equity market reforms have brought Indian equity markets to world class. And why did that happen? In part, neither the government nor politicians had any stake in the Bombay Stock Exchange. Uh, the Bombay Stock Exchange was private, right? And they felt it was holding up progress, and so they wanted to move uh, to best practices quickly. Moreover, most people thought the National Stock Exchange wouldn't succeed. There had been other attempts to start exchanges, which hadn't worked. And so people ignored the National Stock Exchange until it was so big it could not be ignored. But by then, it was too late. So in a sense, the National Stock Exchange worked because it didn't create the kind of opposition. And also, the big players who usually oppose reforms, elements of the government, politicians, did not have any stake in, in opposing it at this point. And so the modernization of market infrastructure is one of the main success stories in India. So market infrastructure modernized, great success story. The advent of private and foreign banks in India was another success story. The dramatic expansion of the new private banks, as they called, the ICICI, HDFC, UTI Bank, which is now called Axis Bank, these were very good and occurred as a result of the reforms proposed by Narasimham. But one thing they may have done is they may have quelled pressures for further reforms. What's happened in terms of market shares, and I'll talk a little bit more of, of, about this, is essentially the upper middle class and the rich have migrated away from the nationalized banking system towards the private banks and towards the foreign banks. They do a lot of the banking through these entities and not in the nationalized banking system. Similarly, the large banks, for all their high-tech stuff, not for low-cost funding, but for all their higher-tech stuff, go to the private banks, go to the uh, foreign banks. As a result, two important constituencies to push for reforms, that is the large firms and the upper middle class, have been taken out of the equation. And the national banks are serving more and more clientels that don't have as much of, of an economic voice. And this is becoming uh, an increasing problem as we go along. So I just want to uh, 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 mention this as one of the potential adverse consequences of reform success. But there were other successes. That is, the non-performing assets of the banking system were brought down as the recovery methods were enhanced. And uh, this uh, allowed for growth in credit, uh, which has been tremendous over the last three or four years. The increased competition in the banking sector has also been very, very uh, good. The competition has come, as I said, from the private sector banks and the foreign banks, from money market mutual funds, from insurance companies, and certainly from the booming stock market, which, which is also attracting funds away from the banking sector. Um, banking privileges are weakening. Uh, at this point. What are the privileges the banking system has? Uh, it always had access to low-cost savings. But because investors now have so many other opportunities, they're less and less willing to put their money into the banking sector 
at low, uh, at low returns. They're moving away. So this privilege of the banking system is waning over time. The other privilege they have is access to the payment system. Over time, this will also weaken. As we know, money market mutual funds here have access to the payment system. That will happen in India. It is inevitable. And so these banking privileges will weaken. So as a result of reforms, good things have happened to the banking system. But also, there are increasing pressures of competition. And the privileges that they historically had are, are weakening. At the same time, the burdens that they have are increasing. The priority sector obligations are still with them and still force them to set aside a significant portion of their funds to sectors that are not particularly remunerative at below market interest rates. And this is a big uh, uh, way, uh, weight on banking profits. Similarly, the obligations to put money in unremunerated reserves, that is the CRR, or in government bonds, that is SLR, also weigh on banking profits. So competition increasing, your privilege is weakening, but your burdens now increasing uh, if in effective terms. So there's much more pressure on banks now to find new markets and to squeeze more profits out of existing ones, right? And this is where the problem is starting to emerge because the public sector banks are falling behind. Why are they falling behind? Because the big reform that was proposed by Narasimham in terms of getting them away from the lap of the government was not undertaken, right? What kinds of constraints is that putting on them? Well, go back to the kinds of constraints that the public, that being part of the government puts on you. One, you can't hire people in the market at market wages. You have to pay, you can't pay more than the secretary to the government of India gets. The secretary to the government of India gets 26,000 rupees a month, which is about $600. Forget the perks and priv other privileges, but $600 a month. You're going to pay the chairman of the State Bank of India, which is about a $150 billion bank, $600 a month, right? Now, how much talent can you actually pick up? Well, the chairman has chairman's house and so on, uh, and you know, gets all the status, et cetera. Maybe the chairman will stay on. But anybody below him is not going to work for the State Bank of India at those wages. He's going to go to a private sector bank. So attracting talent, extremely difficult. Second, remember I told you there's the CVC, that is Central Vigilance Commission. That is actually a big problem. If you make a loan to a private sector company, a large loan, based on your business judgment, and the loan goes bad, it's not your boss who looks at it and says, that was a, a, a really bad loan you made, or you're a schmuck for having made that loan. It's the, the Central Vigilance Commission which comes and interviews you to find out why you made that loan, what money exchanged hands, whether you took a bribe, et cetera, et cetera. So what that does is it makes these banks very risk averse. Similarly, if you're going out for a technology contract, you want to upgrade your technology, right? If you don't go through the government tendering process, et cetera, and, and take the lowest cost bid, which often is not the best, best bid, Again, you have to answer questions in Parliament. You have to answer questions from the Vigilance Commission, et cetera, et cetera. So the point here is, because these banks are governed as if they're government entities, rather than governed as if they're private sector entities, but at the same time thrown in to the pool to compete with fast-moving private sector entities in an increasingly competitive market, they're falling behind, right? And that is, going to, that is going to create problems, which I'll come to in just a second. Uh, so what you see nowadays is for the earnings that they're making, public sector banks are valued in the market at much lower prices than private sector banks. Uh, one potential uh, reason for this is simply there is a discount for belonging to the government, because the government makes you do certain things which private sector companies aren't doing are not required to do. For example, if the market has a really, really bad day, you may get a call from the government saying, why don't you put some money into the market to, to prop it up, right? So that kind of call doesn't go to a private sector bank. That is partly a reason for the government discount. But also, there is much lower asset quality uh, of these government uh, sector banks. Uh, 
despite all the threat of the Central Vigilance Commission, et cetera, et cetera, they still managed to make more non-performing assets, create more non-performing assets than the private banks or the foreign banks. In part, this is because they simply don't have the skills needed to lend in this very competitive environment. For example, evaluating a petrochemical plant requires engineering skills, requires skills of evaluation, which they don't necessarily have. Uh, they have slower growth. In part, it is because they're bigger, but in part, it is because they can't raise any more capital. The government doesn't want to allow these banks to raise capital. Uh, at the same time, it is not willing to let go of these banks and uh, allow them to be privatized. So many of these banks are at 51% stake. The government has 51%. If it allows them to raise capital from the markets, the government stake will go below 51%. So it can't allow them to raise money from the market, but it doesn't have the money itself to put into these banks. So these guys are stuck without capital not being allowed to grow. Uh, they have much lower productivity uh, in, these, in these banks. Uh, some of this is because they haven't adopted technology. Uh, right now what happens is when a transaction is undertaken by a bank branch, right, the entire transaction is processed in the branch itself if it's a public sector bank. If it's a private sector bank, what happens is the branch is just the front office. Everything then gets sent to a common centralized back office, which is far more efficient, of course, a way of doing this. The private sector banks have got the technology to do this and are using it. The public sector banks haven't moved to that hub and spoke way of processing. And as a result, they have much higher costs. Uh, also, the public sector banks are still hobbled by the fact that they were forced to move much more into rural branches. And those rural branches are tremendously unprofitable. Let me show you uh, a, an example of this. Uh, look at uh, uh, the uh, state, th these are numbers for public sector banks. Uh, the profit per employee is 0.24, uh, 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 the profit per branch is 0.24 crores, for private banks it's 0.84. It has uh, uh, about remained, uh, uh, actually it's gone a little worse in 2007. Similarly, you have the profit per employee for the private banks 7.6 the profit per employee for the public sector banks 2.6. This is as of 2007. Public sector banks look far worse than private <laughs> sector banks. But a lot of the difference lies in the rural uh, banks. Okay? If you look at SBI's urban banks, they're only about half as profitable uh, as, the, uh, as the private sector bank average. But the rural bank is so much less profitable and that's what brings down the public sector average. Similarly, if you look at the profit per employee, SBI in the urban bank, uh, branches is almost where the, uh, the private banks are. The rural branches are terrible. So part of the unprofitability of the public sector banks comes from the fact that they have a huge rural network which is not being utilized, which is actually not making anything like the kinds of loans it has to make. Uh, the public sector banks also have lost, as I said, the upper class. The upper class has gone to the private sector banks and to the foreign banks. They've also lost the younger customers. Younger customers, again, are going to the cooler banks, the private sector banks and the foreign banks. The older customers who are less profitable are, are still hanging on to the public sector banks. Furthermore, the public sector banks have been terrible at segmenting the market, at going after these high net worth customers. And as a result, because they haven't gone out onto the street, they're just getting the walking customers who are their stayed old customers. And finally, they're losing share in fee-based business. Essentially, what you have is 70% of the banking system is underperforming tremendously. And that's because it is constrained because of its links to the government. It's not helped by its links to the government. Okay? Um, finally, one of the consequences is the public sector banks have their presence in rural areas, but they're not reaching out. The public sector bank employee is sitting in his branch and waiting for people to come. That's not how you access the rural poor. They don't walk into bank branches. You have to go out and give them credit. This is what microfinance institutions are doing. You have to go out and attract their savings. So the poor are left out because they 
everybody thinks the public sector banks will take care of them, but the public sector banks are not going after them. And the private sector banks have no interest in them because they don't see them as being profitable. And they're being left out of the whole equation. And here, I think, is the large problem in India. Uh, look at uh, branch openings, for example, just to, just to see that this, this thing is accelerating. Uh, if you look at foreign banks, private sector banks, etc., everybody wants to open in metropolitan areas. Everybody wants to open in urban areas. Look at the number in rural areas. The number of branches in rural areas over the last few years is actually falling. Okay? So th the bottom line I want, I, I, I want to say is that this entire burst of competition has been very useful for improving the efficiency of the banking system in general. You've seen some improvements in the efficiency of SBI, as you saw, productivity for employee and so on. It's been very useful for the rich and the upper middle class. It has been less useful for the state-owned banks, which have started falling behind in many ways as far as competition goes. And it's not touched the rural poor or the urban poor at all. And one example of the fact that it's not touched uh, the rural poor is if you look at the share of borrowing from money lenders, that is this particular graph, uh, it was coming down all the time till 1991. Over the last 10 years, the share of borrowing from money lenders has actually gone up, right? So that is suggesting that the financial system, especially the banking system, is benefiting a number of segments. But one segment, it hasn't benefited, partly because that space is occupied by public sector banks, which are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, is the very poor. And they are being hurt in this process. Uh, so what is uh, going to happen going forward? This, this, is, this is sort of a quick and dirty summary. Uh, obviously, I've left out a lot. Uh, it's, there's a lot of good things in the Indian banking system that, that one can talk about. But I think the biggest problem is the fact that you are seeing an enormous part of the Indian citizenry being left out at this point and falling further behind because the natural people who are supposed to service them are not servicing them. So what are the constraints on further reform and what form should further reform take? In my view, further reform should make uh, at least one of the targets for further reform should be greater inclusion. Uh, but that would require, in a sense, making the public sector banks far more competitive in those markets. Politicians don't want to lose control of the public sector. Now, there are those who are ideologically opposed. The left doesn't want it to go below 51% for a variety of reasons. Uh, clearly, this is not so much motivated by the public purpose. It's not so much that the public sector banks are delivering on what they were supposed to deliver. By many counts, they're not. Right? So, what is it? Some of it is ideology and the fact that some of these parties are catering to their constituencies like the unions in the public sector banks. Some of it is still the fact that when you have a public sector bank in your area, you can exercise local patronage. You can get the bank to employ some of your favorite, favorite people. Uh, you can also live in the bank's guest houses if you want to travel around. Uh, those things are useful and are reasons why you still tether them uh, but also, I think the government still believes that it's good to have a public sector to do your command because you can exercise those rights of control when needed. For example, when you want to prop up the currency market or the stock market, these are the guys to do your bidding. So for a variety of these reasons, there is no strong political consensus to let go of the public sector and to say, let us reduce the, private, uh, let us reduce the government's stake. At the same time, now we have a different force coming in. Because the public sector is so weak and will weaken going forward, the Reserve Bank is very worried about stability issues. And it says if those guys will not let the public sector stand on its own feet and hire the right people, etc., we're not going to let them get any weaker, which means we're going to go against new activities. We're going to oppose branching for all these private sector banks. We're going to oppose entry by the foreign banks. Uh, we basically going to limit activities because we are going to protect the public sector and make sure that it stays healthy. The only way you can make the public sector stay healthy is by killing the activities of everybody else. So as a result, the Reserve Bank, in my view, is increasingly opposing reform 
rather than pushing reform because it says if the political establishment will not let them go, we are not going to let them get weaker because then we'll be accused of inducing instability in the system. So you've got the banking system caught between a rock and a hard place, the rock of politicians not willing to let go and the hard place of the Reserve Bank actually opposing further reform for anybody. Uh, now, foreign competition could, could, could help in a way by you know, putting the writing on the wall. If you don't do it, this is what's happening in China. Because China, China is committed to opening up to foreign competition, according to its WTO agreement, uh, the government has all the incentive to let the banking system develop uh, because they have to stand up to that kind of competition. In India, however, because the Reserve Bank is also centrally involved in managing the foreign exchange process, and because management of the exchange rate has now become uh, such a big factor in Indian uh, economic management, they're allowed to say, forget the foreigners. The foreigners are going to complicate foreign exchange management. We're not going to you know, allow them. In fact, we're going to push back anything we've already allowed. We're going to prevent uh, foreign investors from coming in uh, through the debt route. We're going to prevent Indian companies from borrowing abroad. This was the ban on external commercial borrowing. Now they're debating a sterilization tax, which means anytime you bring in money from outside, you've got to pay a fee because it costs the government to sterilize that. Uh, they want to limit participation in the bond markets. A whole lot of restrictions are coming in, in addition to what already is there, because the Reserve Bank is managing the currency. So two big factors, three big factors opposing reforms. One, the politicians want, don't want to let go. Two, the Reserve Bank wants to protect the weak. And three, the Reserve Bank setting currency management as the overall holy grail of its management is also opposing opening up to the outside because it will complicate currency management. And increasingly, the real economy, which was liberalized effectively in the 1990s, and the equity markets are looking very, very different from the banking sector, which is still, in a sense, heavily constrained. So uh, what will happen? I think this will have to change. This will have to give way because the, uh, things are becoming overly complicated. Eventually, the government will have to find a way of separating the public sector banks from the government. This is key to every other reform. It's not because the private sector in India is necessarily better at owning these banks, but it is because once you liberate them from the government, you actually can give their management far more leeway to do the things they have to do. Because being tied to the government, there's so many more constraints on public sector management. So what are the options? One is privatization. The question is, who do you privatize to in India? Privatizing to Citibank is not going to be acceptable in general. If you want to sell State Bank of India to Citibank, which is or, or to Bank of America, or to Chase. Those are the banks who can take over, or uh, 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 Bank of China. Those are banks that are big enough to take over the Indian banks, but that is not going to be a politically acceptable alternative. The only other deep pockets in India are the big business houses. But India is already becoming, to some extent, an oligarchy. If you privatize by selling the banking system to Reliance and Tata's, you're going to have a very, very concentrated uh, wealth uh, in, in the economy, do you want that? I think most Indians who think about it will not want that. Um, can you, in a sense, make these independent entities but still dealing them from the government? There are ways of doing it, but many of them involve bringing down the government's stake from 51%, and that the politicians essentially will not, at least given their ideology, allow. So now we are into the realm of third best solutions or fourth best solutions. In my sense, going forward, what, what will have to happen is you will try and distance them from the government without actually privatizing them uh, by strengthening their boards, uh, liberating decision making from judicial scrutiny, allowing them a free hand in recruiting. In a sense, this can be done by slate of hand, and it is being done in various government companies. Essentially, make the government one step removed from the actual bank by putting the bank in a kind of holding company. The government owns the holding company, the holding company owns the bank, but the bank then can be, by some interpretations, freed from the rigors of being a direct owned entity by the government, and then can pay adequate salaries and so on.
That is yet to be tested. But if the government will not go below 51%, that's the only alternative. But once you do that, you can actually have professionally managed companies free of from government influence. And if you let these companies run for some time, if you let them consolidate, buy each other up, create a stronger banking system, you can very easily open up to the private sector, to the, to, to, uh, the foreign sector, and not see these guys overnight vanish, uh, taken over by, uh, by the outside. They will actually be able to com uh, uh, compete. The alternative, if you do nothing, is the Air India solution, right? Many of you remember Air India when it was a great carrier. Uh, it had excellent service, it had new planes. Uh, I did fly Air India last week in, in one of its new planes. I can recommend that uh, to all of you. I think it's, it's a sea change. But in between, we had 20 years of steady decline, where Air India went from first class carrier to a third class carrier, right? That is the fate of the public sector banks if reform doesn't take place because they account for 70% of the banking system, but they will decline because they cannot compete given where they are uh, and given the constraints placed on them. But what is more important is because they cannot compete, you will also restrain the rest of the banking system. You'll prevent foreign entry because you say these guys can't stand up to foreign banks. You will prevent the private sector banks from expanding because you'll say that you, they can't stand up to private sector expansion. And if the RBI continues as it's doing, it'll put more and more strictures on the banking system in order to protect the 70%. And so rather than then dying a quick death, it'll be a slow and painful death, but it will take the banking system with it. And so from having a first-class banking system, at least amongst emerging markets, India will have a third-rate banking system. Uh, so I think the key is to send the message that this needs to be changed. And a lot of people are focusing on, you know, this is new India. We have to do this because we want to capture a greater market share and so on. Uh, we want to create a global financial services system. I think that's a bad, that's, that's the bad, bad message uh, to win on. Uh, you're not going to win that battle because people say, why do we need a, uh, a first class financial system? Why do we need an internationally competitive thing? The way to get, I think, the, uh, the, the point across to politicians is to say, you're failing miserably on inclusion. The poor are not being banked. They're not getting any of these services. And that is because you're putting this monopoly public sector banking system as the main agent who is to give you services. And they're not succeeding. And the reason they're not succeeding is to serve the bottom of the pyramid, you have to be more innovative than the average